All right, oh. I... What? Your car models and alcohol have all moved. No, I've moved. None of those other things have moved. But I've moved. <laughs> this was my... I commuted today to a new spot. You, <laughs> you are giving all of our viewers a whole new world. A new... Oh, no. Fantastic point of view. Oh, no. I know it's coming. You know what there is here? There's no one to tell us no or where to go. How, how old were you when that movie came out? 106. I don't know. Uh, what movie was it? Was it Aladdin? Aladdin, yeah. I've never been, seen it. You've never seen it. It's like 93, 94. That was like prime Disney era for me. I will be... I probably shouldn't even confess this, but the last, the first and last Disney movie I watched post being six or seven years old was The Little Mermaid. And I watched that when I was like 15, when I was babysitting all these kids. That's how I paid for, you know, my first Volkswagen Beetle was babysitting money. And everyone wanted to watch The Little Mermaid. And I'm like, kill me now, kill me now. And you watch it 750 times and you're like, Prince Eric is so nice. And Ariel's such an idiot. Why is she leaving her, her family and her sisters and her dad for this dude that she's never talked to? And this is whatever. But then you get like stuck back in because there's the French chef dude. And he's like, hee hee hee. Ha, ha. And then you laugh and you're like, ha, that's really funny. And then Ursula, poor unfortunate soul. It's just amazing. It's such a good movie. And then I moved to Germany, finished high school, and never watched another Disney movie. So I never saw Aladdin. I never saw... Lion King. Like, Lion King. All of those, like, peak 90s things. What about the I Pixar just, movies? I saw Cars. Forrest and Cars 2. Mm-hmm. Darr. But those I think Disney that's movies. it. Okay. Uh, we're supposed to talk about Cars and not the animated Hudson Hornets. Although, I, I, Hudson Hornet is actually a guilty pleasure of mine. I like Hudson Hornets. Um... But there could be an episode in there, perhaps a guilty pleasure. Is this, is this where your brain is? This, is this your, where your brain goes and how your brain works? Is like we talk about Pixar movies and Cars, and you're like Hudson Hornet. Yeah, that is the to me that is like the iconic car from that movie. The scene where Homeboy, what's his name, uh, Doc, is drifting, like that was epic. You don't no, you should never mind. Anyway, Hudson Hornets are cool. It was cool to see them get mainstream recognition. I actually used to work across the street from those guys at a vintage car dealer, and they were true car guys, and they would come over and like, see the stuff that we had, and they would actually like, study the cars to see how that, the chrome reflected so that they could render it properly. So they were oh. always kind of over hanging out with us, and Hudson Hornets, that there's you know, someone there who has an actual Hudson Hornet that's painted in the fabulous Hudson Hornet NASCAR uh, paint scheme. So anyway, cool. uh, that was my Hudson Hornet um, digression. Uh, I, this well, is what this show is all about. Uh, this is, by the way, digression. Digression about cars, and that's why this is the Carmudgeon Show. My name is Jason. Can we see? We have to introduce this stuff. Maybe there are people who are watching who don't know who you are, and that your middle name is Hyphen, and they don't know my name, which is I don't even remember anymore. It's been in lockdown for too long. <laughs> but anyway, this is the Carmudgeon Show, where we are angry about everything, including the fact that we aren't angry about cars because we love them, except that we hate them and the people who own them, and then we hate the cars, and then. We get all frustrated about everything. But anyway, my name is Jason Camisa, and this is that guy on, depending on which side of the screen the editor puts it, him, it, sorry, puts him on, that is Derek Tam Scott. We're going to have a pronouns discussion now? It's going to be one of those episodes, I can tell. <laughs> uh, yeah. I know this because of my hair. The, the focus episode. This, now, that, now that I've hit that critical mass again, where the only thing I can do is like an, a late 90s, early 2000s, faux hawk situation because otherwise I look like halfway between I don't know Marge Simpson and like <laughs> I don't even know how to describe what happens to my there's a reason my hair is usually short and this is it <laughs> so. something something boy band 1990s oh should we talk about our shirts you have a shirt with your car on it I have a shirt with my car on it and, and your I can't plan. see in the in it, it depend it, this Oh, okay. You have yours on too. Okay. So inside story, everyone, in case you can't see my shirt, I will stand up, but I don't want you to see that I am actually in my underwear today. Um, uh, come on. We've been locked down for like 10 years. Can't we just, you know, are we comfortable enough to admit that we're in our underwear? Um, uh, I have merch and Derek has merch and we have merch. 
And so this t-shirt that I'm wearing is my Lotus that, um, that we here at ECB, and by that I mean my friend Jack, who is an incredibly talented artist, uh, has turned into a t-shirt. And it's my Lotus with the license plate that says, I hate everyone, because no truer words have ever been spoken, ever. Um, it's got the ECB logo where the supercharged thing would be, and the T in the Lotus is actually a middle finger because I hate you. A um, couple little Easter eggs in the, in the t-shirt. Um, and honestly, I, I may I may hate everyone and everything, but I love this T-shirt. Um, and then we did one for you too. Yeah, so that's a Miura that has no wheels, which is kind of the experience of the Miura that I've had because it's been twelve years <laughs> being restored. And it says, "Get off my lawn," because you know, get off because my lawn. Because you were the only crotchety old man who's also you know in your like extended teenage years who is just trashy enough to park a car on your lawn, but just lucky enough to be able to park a mural on your lawn. And the only person that I would ever be, see, can imagine, who would ever be like, get that mural off my lawn, is you. Yeah. <laughs> the, I mean, I'm also a fan of cars in weird places. Like, I'm all ready to, to sell all my worldly possessions and buy a going and live in a cardboard box. That sounds pretty nice right now. Glad you said that, because frankly, I'm ready to give up too. I'm, I'm... I decided that I'm going to start drinking um, for the show, and I'm drinking a Coca-Cola. <laughs> drinking a, a beverage with sugar. It, it is a zero sugar. I, look, yeah. I don't actually drink, and uh, despite how I look, I try to be pretty healthy. And um, yeah, so soda. This is how bad the COVID-19 situation has, has become, that we have t-shirts of our own car, which are for sale down below. There's a link. I don't know how the, this is going to work. The shirt's not the car. The shirts are for sale. Uh, there's also a, a couple other shirts that maybe we should wear next time because I don't have mine with me. Yeah, I'm, we have I'm to. going to uh, grab it. There's a. Yeah, we have to figure out what the other ones are. Or there's a, uh, a, a launcher wheel. That's not even a product placement. <laughs> I know. This is ridiculous. Can't Coca-Cola, can you send me like five cents, please? Cherry Coke Zero. You mm. get five cents if you take that to the recycling center. Um, is it? Oh. We, we're oh. supposed to have an episode. Focus. We have an episode. What's oh, the topic for today? Fun. Uh, mom. It, sh it should be, mom, he's making me talk about cars again. So it could be, for example, that I launched another Spotlight, but we should probably leave Spotlight to do that. It could be that I stole the company Launch a Delta Integrale Evo 1, and I've been doing very, very bad things to it, but we'll pro probably talk about that in a different episode. But you asked me something the other day um, that I found very interesting, and I think we can just talk about it having no actual plan which mm. which is what would we be like every do. other episode <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> um you basically asked what's your type and you didn't ask that in 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 this sort of normal way um but you were saying like what is it about people that encourages them to buy a certain type of car so like you know what what is got to be wrong with you to buy a british car is basically i think how you phrased it <laughs> that was the example i gave i mean there's British cars have a very unique space, especially vintage British cars. Uh, they have this whole like terrible reputation about electrical reliability. <laughs> um, <laughs> Just second, make sure you're watching. <laughs> sort of this like inability to function, mm -hmm. uh, and so there's kind of some shortcomings that come with them. Uh, I mean, uh, most vintage cars have shortcomings. It's kind of a question of what kind of shortcomings would you like to have. Uh, Did you just answer the entire question? Is you buy the car whose crazy fits you? Yeah, great. Great, we're well done. Good Eight chat. minutes, 58 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I think it's a really good point. So you can kind of stereotype and, you know, probably shouldn't do that. But we as humans, we're always looking for patterns. We're always, you know, grouping people into this group or that group or, you know, people who have had COVID and people who don't. Um, and, oh, you know, people dark. who think we should lock down and people who think we should all go lick doorknobs. But... But, but we're always looking for patterns, and it is really interesting to start to look at the patterns that emerge from car collecting. And not even just like car collecting. The, you know, who chooses to drive a 1977 Rolls Royce, for example? Like, what is wrong with that person, or right with that person, that forces them to choose that? And should we speak to such a person? <laughs> I mean, I think it takes this a special type of... Well, if you want to have like a variety of interesting experiences, and by that I mean meet a lot of weird people, then I, I think, yes, you, you ask them these questions and say, like, what is it that you get about it? I think that 
the thing that I learned was that a lot of these people don't take things seriously, and so a lot of it is a reflection of their sense of humor. Uh, so when you sort of like, why do you have that car? And they're like, it's just absurd. Like, look at it. That's why. And that's like, why that's you a perfectly bought a satisfactory answer. There's not supposed to be, there doesn't need to be like this really long winded discussion about, well, these are the following rational reasons why this matches perfectly with my identity. It's more like, I don't know, it made me laugh or it was a good deal or it's sentimental to me or something like that. Like, I, you raise a good really point. I mean, look, there's no point in trying to make a rational explanation why any of us have a car, right? I mean, if, there, if that were the case, the rational explanation is I'm driving a Prius because it's a modern car that's only 3,000 pounds that gets 53 miles per gallon that has a hatchback and all the rest of the stuff. And I'm going to go kill myself now. Um, but <laughs> you're right in that it should really kind of end there. Like, car made me laugh. Yeah. I mean, that's a perfectly satisfactory exp- explanation as far as I'm concerned at this point. I, I have this sort of discussion with people who aren't car people and they're like, why do you like vintage cars or why is a vintage Ferrari worth 10 times as much money as a new Ferrari? And you list the, this, this litany of reasons why it's, you know, vintage Ferrari is what it is. It's, it's not reliable. It's not safe. It's not practical. It's not high performance. It's not comfortable. It's doesn't, it's like it smells bad. Uh, it's expensive no. to keep. No, no, like leather the fumes. Is no, 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 like when fumes you when you amazing. when you like get out of an old car at the end of the day and your clothes all smell. They stink. It's fucking yeah. amazing. Uh, so anyway, they, like by all objective measures, it's garbage. But for some reason, it's worth a great deal of money. Uh, and so it's. I think it's like we say oftentimes. This is an emotional, subjective thing. It's not rational because, like you say, if it was rational, you'd get a Prius or a Corolla or like the most dull, highest performance, best optimized car. That the way that you know most people treat a washing machine. You don't buy a washing machine on the basis of how it connects to your identity. I, we, I don't. I don't know. There, maybe they're a washing machine. I, I bought a washing machine because it didn't play little music things at me. Oh, you just froze up. Sorry. Yeah, that was, it's very functional, though. That's a functional reason. Not because it made you feel a certain way, other than the absence of annoyance. The like absence annoyance. of anger. When you turn on a washing machine and it goes, you're like, shut up. I didn't ask you to play me a little fucking happy song. I asked you to wash the goddamn clothes. Doesn't your, your Volkswagen make a noise like that when the doors open? Okay, that, says, that says La Cucaracha, which people thought was on purpose because they're, oh, they're Mexican built. My car is built in Germany. Thank you, both of them. Um, that's a cute door buzzle. A buzzer. It's better. It's not as cool as Honda. I love this story. Which we've talked about. That means H in um, Morse code. Morse code. Um, and it's not like, remember like Honda's when you left the light on or Infinity's did like a doorbell. Ding, ding, ding. Mm. Anyway, um, yes, you're, you're totally right. It, I hate to say that, <laughs> but you are kind of right. It is a it is a, a an irrational and emotional purchase. But does that mean that, like, you you asked that question? And start, I started to think about it. Like, are all old Volkswagen people crazy? Because I'm crazy and I love old Volkswagen. So like, you start to think, how can we? Wh- where's the overlap in the Venn diagram? Um, and I I get all the time like people have said like, oh. You should have, you should, you as the lover of high revving four cylinder engines and lightweight cars and wonderful engineering should have a Honda. And the joke always uh, in between the, in the VW community and the Honda community, which are sort of rivals in different parts of the US, um, is that the only difference between Volkswagen guys and Honda guys is that Volkswagen guys are willing to put up with all kinds of shit breaking. And the Honda guys are willing, not, they are not willing to put, it down, put up with breakdowns, but they are willing to put up with maybe a little bit less charm. And you know a little bit less of a, an experience, um, so th- th- it just becomes you either fall into this. I would rather have the experience of being broken down on the side of the road and crying, or I would rather have this experience of driving everywhere and not having any fun. I, I think a lot of people was... don't intentionally make the decision. Also, they sort of end of up in one place where they're like, "This is what I was exposed to," or my friend mm-hmm. was super into this, or my dad, or whatever. And so you just sort of get. It's like a nature versus nurture thing. You sort of, conte- your, your context actually causes you to get really into a certain yeah, thing. I fought Porsches and didn't become a douchebag. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for you. Come on, give me something. I mean, you can try I mean, and you are, it, How do you, if you are already a douchebag, how do you be, become a douchebag by purchasing a car? Why don't you answer that question? Oh! Uh, no, I don't. I know, but I think you can try something on. Like, you know, I've owned cars that 
I didn't fall well, yeah, in love with. Some people, uh, I think, converts. open open minded people will will do that. I think some people mm-hmm. get really like, oh, I'm only going to ever do this, and I'm super committed to, you know, Audis or whatever. You know, that you get. There's every group seems to have their sort of rabid crowd where they're like, ah, I'm super into this, and my garage consists entirely of this one thing, or this one make. Oh, you grimaced. Mm-hmm. You're getting a little value judgment there. I, one make wonders are... Look, there's nothing... If you find your brand of crazy and you love your brand of crazy, whether that is... I just saw Buick Grand National today and I was, I, I was actually leaving, funny story, leaving Derek's house with this very t-shirt fresh off the press. Made it like a block and there was an awesome Buick Grand National in great condition, all shiny, stinking like it was burning way too much fuel because you know, it was running properly. 80s turbo um and he had a custom plate and i just followed him around i'm I'm in my scirocco his plate was like gnx 1987 but all garbled up together um and or gn 1980 whatever whatever it was and i'm like wow we're both in 1987 cars like we are the hottest shit of 1987 right now um i don't want a grand national I drove one once and I must say it might be the worst car I've ever driven in my life. But I completely appreciate how awesome they were. The performance was amazing. They were badass looking. And here's some dude driving down the street. He's got music playing, whatever. And he's just automatically the coolest fucking guy in the world to me. Like, he is the guy who I was like, yes. And I did actually jump out of the car at a red light and take a picture of the two cars together. (laughs) and posted on Instagram. I'm like, well, it's 1987 and I hate today. Um, But it... uh, there's definitely a different brand of crazy that he has, and I respect that. So it doesn't really matter. Well, because you've his... identified another person as crazy, they just don't have the same disorder you do. Yeah, yeah. And I but think they all have the same crazy. crazy. And so it's like car folks have to, well, yeah. it's like, oh, we all feel really strongly about smog laws. So we have to put aside our personal vehicular preferences to unite against the common enemy of smog laws or, yeah. you know, whatever. That's true. The, 25 year we importation should, rule or whatever we sort of start another one of those um oh there's a side effect of drinking coke <laughs> <Bless you. laughs> sorry i tried to make that quiet i should do not drink a carbonated beverage on a podcast <clears throat> unless podcast rules number one uh, 101 um uh what were we <laughs> smog laws <laughs> we should make one of those um uh online Thingies where you petitions can go and sign. That they petitions where you do, go, yeah. yeah. What's that? There's what's that one site? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Change.org. Um, change, change.org. We should make a change.org. Get rid of all smog regulations because we want to kill the planet with uh, Grand National. It's fears. been attempted before. Okay. Uh, I yeah. mean, also the amount of use that these vintage cars see. Uh, we don't have to have a smog conversation right now. No, we should. That's another episode where we okay. go and do the freaking like just the, this is smogonomics where we look at the actual environmental impact of driving a classic car um, versus buying a new car and driving that, because I'd love to. Anyway, um, but the, 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 the interesting thing is we all have friends who collect cars for very different reasons, and we're okay with it, right? So again, dude in Grand National, I, I don't want one. I think he's really cool. I have friends that will only buy cars in cool colors. And, you know, on first... At first glance, you look at their collection and they have things as disparate as, you know, some Japanese K cars to massive big American boats to an NSX to, I mean, there's sort of tastes are all over the map in Mercedes 107 SL. Um, but the one common thread is that they love crazy colored cars. And I thought that was the coolest thing. And then they started collecting cars that were all white. And I was like, this is not you. Like, What's wrong? Are you are you feeling okay? Do you have a fever? Perhaps a dry cough? Um, <laughs> have you been to Wuhan recently? They started to get like boring with the car color with the colors, and they're like, "Well, this is a great example." And I just was like, "That's not your brand of crazy. Like, you need to go and forget about that great example of whatever it was that's white. Go buy a purple with pink polka dot version of it. That's shitty, and that's on brand for you because it's a cool color." Um, I think it's cool that we can all sort of, I think we should certainly as car guys all band together and say, it's okay that you can collect whatever you want that, that strikes your fancy um, or that matches your crazy. You don't have to pigeonhole yourself into this one type of car. Yeah, but I mean, certain people will just gravitate towards certain things and they'll say, you know, I'll only buy a car that handles well. Like I, I certainly 
that, that we have customers or friends who who have cars and it's clear that they're drivers and that they won't mm -hmm. own anything unless it's a joy to drive fast in the corners and they're out there every weekend or four times a week you know hauling ass through the twisties and so that is a reflection of their personal priorities yeah and I'm, I'm i mean if you look at my cars it's kind of the same way i mean the only thing that i care about is the experience i don't really care how shitty the rest of the car is or how good it is or how usable it is or i don't care um it's driving but i think the people that, that we both know who are about the experience have everything from, I think we know who we're talking to, of a Peugeot 205 to a 512BB to, or 365BB, whatever it is, some sort of flat 12 Ferrari to um, Porsches to, he's, you know, his tastes are kind of all over the map. And I love that. I think that's so cool. Yes. And it's united by a love of driving. Right. And I, I think that people who are sort of single that's why I gave the look of like, oh my God, you know, one mark people. It's like, go on and experience other stuff. There's, there are other things that will, will dovetail with your crazy. Um, that I you have can to experience. agree with that. I think that if you experience just one brand, it's, I don't know, maybe you've just really know yourself. And you, to me, it says that you have a one dimensional personality. That's what I read between the lines. Ouch. Wow. That's worse than the dirty look I gave. I know. I know. <laughs> um, I don't know. Well, it, I, I mean, it's, the other thing you could say on the flip side about someone like me is that you have ADD, which is per perhaps possible also. Car uh, aut Automotive, yeah, ADD. Uh, but, you know, I, sometimes I have stuff that handles, sometimes I don't. Some, it's very, like, disparate, and I don't even know how to characterize what I like. You know, we, I don't think, I don't look at your taste in cars and think, wow, he's got a problem. I look at your taste in cars and think, wow, he's got a wide there's a wide variety of cars that appeal for him to him and that's cool like i think car collecting should kind of be an inclusive club rather than an exclusive club right like it, it i i loved that there yeah. was when i lived in the midwest there was definitely a honda versus volkswagen you know thing but it was fun i mean it was you know you knew when you were at a red light and you were in a vw and there's a honda guy next to you that you you were going to race like it was just kind of a foregone conclusion Better be on your A game. And like that, that made it fun. But like if I saw some dude on the side of the road broken down in a Civic, um, you know. Sorry. If some guy in a Civic saw me broken down on the side of the road to Volkswagen, <laughs> he would have stopped. And it, it was, it was, you know, we we're all this together. You see somebody whose car breaks down, you know, we're, we're car guys at the end of the day. Um, and it's interesting to try to find those things that you know, that, that why do people drive this type of car? Why do people try to drive that car? I have, we have a friend, you know him also, who collects, collect is a strong word. He tends to buy and enjoy for a couple of years the best kept examples of the least desirable cars of all time. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. This is our buddy Josh, and he's, um, he's a good guy. I mean, he's a really good guy, and he's a total car guy. Why do you but leave with that? Is holy the implication shit. Is that he He's because look at the guy. fucking cars he looks at. Like, he's constantly sending me links, and I'm like, I just respond no. Or, like, I do the thumbs down, like, tap back thing on iMessage. Like, what the fuck are you looking at that K car piece? And not, by the way, not like Japanese. K-E-I. -E You're talking about, like, like, I'm talking about Dodge. Plymouth Reliant. What the fuck are you looking at? But at the same time, like, he's got, <laughs> he's going to kill me. So he just bought a Jaguar XF Sport Brake. Um, that's a year old with like, you know, it was like a, a loaner car from the dealership and that's like new daily transportation for his girlfriend. Fucking rad. Fucking absolutely rad. I love the car. It's a station wagon. It's a Jaguar. It's gorgeous. It's black. Uh, it's got everything with red seats. It's fucking amazing. Um, his, that replaced, by the way, a compass. Hmm. The comp ass. Come piss. Wow. It, but, oh, that's what... Ugh. I mean, the car is just wretched. But while we're bashing him, if we look at his collector cars, like he just sold his Suzuki Sidekick, um, which is the nicest, like, teal green Sidekick you've ever seen to another one of our friends who collects the worst kept examples of the worst cars of all time. Thank God he doesn't watch this. He'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Him. Um, I but he's got... It. But Josh already had, also has a Colt, Plymouth Colt Turbo. Like, the car has got, like, this poor guy who owned it before him, his original owner, 
put a new motor in it, and he just did like millions of dollars of maintenance and work on a Plymouth Colt Turbo. Cool! Like, I think that's great. I wouldn't be caught dead owning that fucking car, but I think it's really cool that he does. He's got... Well, and that's what's nice gen. about, like, when you go to Radwood and you see, like, a yes. really pristine example of something where you're like, I haven't seen one of those, period, in decades, let alone a nice one. Like, then it's really spectacular. And you see all this passion. We're like, wow, this guy has the original brochures and window sticker for, like, I don't know, a LeBaron convertible or some terrible something that no one cares about. And it's Chevy just neat to see the, that there's this enthusiasm out there for it. Like, I mean, you know, I'm glad, better him than me, but I'm glad right. that it exists. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, is that the, is that the magic of Radwood? Is that the actual appeal of that car show? Is that it's not a single make? I mean, and I it's, think so. That's one of the things I most enjoy about it. Huh. Yeah. I mean, when you walk around, you get people who are excited about all of these totally different things. And it's, it's like, it's like the UN of car shows. It's every... You know, it's just one era, so it's all, you know, the, the, if those who don't have been to a Radwood show, it's 1980 to 1999, period. If the car wasn't made in, in that time, don't ever drink a diet, diet cherry Coke Zero while you're on a... And you take another sip. Podcast is delicious. It's so good. Icy cold. It's great. You should try some. Um, visit Coca-Cola.com. Um... It, you know, other than, other than this 1980 through 1999 limitation, anything goes. Anything goes. So you'll see a Ferrari F40 parked next to a Ford Taurus. I mean, they sort of curate the parking a little bit better than that, but you get, you get the point. Next to a Mazda Navajo, another car that Josh owns. He owns the nicest two-door manual transmission Navajo in the world. Why? Laminated window cool. sticker, yeah. brochures, I mean, service records. I mean, license plate badge job, right? Because mm-hmm, it's, it's an, so of course good. a Ford Explorer Sport, right? Of course. Um, but I think I love that that inclusiveness of Radwood, and I think I just for the first time after having gone to these shows for a couple of years, figured out what's great about it. It's not. I mean, exclusive. is that and, and that it's more it's than not just like the cars. some guy pulls up in his Honda uh, and goes and parks in the Honda. Yeah, and it's more than yeah, more than just about the cars. Like it's an entire cultural experience, or it's like representative of an era, and not just like the car itself. And so you get some context. I think. Context is really important. Uh, I, I, so I did some academic work about cars because I felt some obligation to justify my enthusiasm for cars when I was uh, at Stanford where you're like not supposed to be into cars. So I, I like did some studying of this. And one of the th- things that we... That, that <laughs> I'm going re- to start really drinking now in a second. I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you need some, some alcohol for that? Yes. Can you um, pull some off the cabinet that's behind you? <clears throat> Uh, what I sort of concluded, there's like a whole bunch of reasons. Like, why do we like cars? Like, there's a whole bunch of reasons. There's uh, the, the aesthetic experience of the car itself, right? The visceral characteristics. Here's this word visceral, but I truly mean the word visceral in this case, which is that it, it is of or relating to the senses. So like it looks a certain way or it sounds a certain way or it feels a certain way. Basically every t- taste, it sense except taste, hopefully. Um, so, Depends how hard you hit the steering wheel in that accident. <laughs> <laughs> Airbag. Uh, so like there's that like basic sort of just it appeals to our senses but there's also like the whole cerebral part where you're talking about engineering and and sort of that kind of technical nerd out part too so if you are technically oriented then that can be interesting too and then you can say oh well how about like cultural stuff and that's where Radwood is really strong where it relates to a certain era or you know Elvis had one of these or Steve McQueen or motorsports is a cultural activity where people get together and like get you know into this thing and so there's a lot of facets to this where you know you can be engaged just like on a basic like oh this makes me feel good like in terms of senses but also like cerebrally and you feel related to like a certain era or you get nostalgia and you get these emotions and stuff so there's all these different sort of bits and pieces that are all present to varying degrees. And I think Radwood certainly is, is good at that. And I, I think also that's why I see you thinking something. I'm just fucking, like, I can't believe you've thought about this. <laughs> because people are like, why do you like cars? And I'm like, because I do. <laughs> because, when did you start liking cars? Always. Like, oh, really? Were you into cars as a kid? Yeah, like when I was two, I'd be like, Buick and Oldsmobile and Shipbox or whatever it was. And what do you like about cars? I like sliding sideways, going fast, making a lot of noise. And, and you're like, there's a cerebral component to that. And there's a visceral. And by that, I mean, 
and of and pertaining to the senses, which then <laughs> incorporates the hippocampus, which is the area of your brain. Like, what the fuck? Just yes. with memory. Exactly. <laughs> oh, fuck me. I can't believe it. I, I mean, this is, this is why we're friends. Because you enlighten me and you teach me different ways of looking at the... Uh, your own life under a microscope. Rationalizing your insanity is what it is. Or just right? fucking you, saying, I like what I like. Fuck well, off if you don't get it. Yeah, now, well, I don't what, know. This is why you went to Stanford and I went to University of Pittsburgh. Because you're mean, like, I'm going to take an existential look at everything. And I'm like, fuck you. I, I like what I like. If you don't like it, I mean, I had to write a senior it. paper about something. And I was like, why not write it about something that's interesting so that it becomes like useful so I can talk about it in over a decade on a podcast instead of like <laughs> shove it in my parents' basement <laughs> so it can get water damaged. So you're also a fortune teller. I mean, I have nothing to say. At my high school, so my, I did an international baccalaureate um, high school diploma, which required this huge project. And mine was calculating the best shift points for maximum acceleration in an Opel Cadet. <laughs> it was a GSI. It was a two-liter eight-valve. My mom's car. Um, and yeah, so you might have done some existential shit, but I did some math nerdy shit. So I think we're both prepared. This is why we're qualified to do a podcast. All these and years how often do you refer back to this paper? Is it widely cited? All the time. Yes. All the time. Yeah, widely cited. Wow. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna, I should probably put a PDF of it. No, definitely not. Um, no, no, I use it. Actually, so I graduated from high school in, in 1793, um, otherwise known as 1993. And in 95, I turned all of that. So that, that project, by the way, took me months like to do all the math. I made this huge matrix with, and I had to calculate all the data, the values by hand. It worked, um, but it was a m- month of calculation. I rewrote the whole thing two years later when I was in college on summer break to run on basic, which is beginner's all-purpose symbolic industrial inf- code. Do you remember what basic stands for? Informational code. Basic, the programming language. So I rewrote the whole thing in basic in like 2000, uh, 1995, and then... In like 99 or 2000, I no longer had a computer that would run basic. So I wrote the whole thing again, rewrote the whole thing again in, in Excel. And the crazy thing is, at first it was like literally months of, like, of calculations. When I wrote it in, in basic, it would take like, you'd input like a dyno chart and all this other stuff in a car. And it would take anywhere between 30 seconds and five minutes for it to spit out the zero to 60 number and the top speed and all this other stuff and the, the best shift points. Um, depending on how fast the computer was. And then I did it in Excel and it's instant. Mm-hmm. And like now this is like, this is the speed of information that even 20 years ago, what took me months to do is now instant. But I use this all the time. Um, I just actually use this to calculate axle torque on a Polestar 1 for the road test I did for road track. So I bet so I suck use it. my high school project more than use your existential college. I'm going to talk about... Why I feel how I feel and whether that feeling is based on another feeling or maybe I should smoke pot or something, you know, like whatever it is that kids in California do in college. Yes, we had a region called, an, um, a dorm called Enchanted Broccoli Forest, which was called that specifically for the volume of people who smoked weed there. It was and that was definitely not your... That's not where I lived, no. Yeah. Goodness, no. You, With all those hippies. Where did you live? You lived in the dorm where there was a, was a mirror out on the lawn in front of it and you sat, sat there and threw things at the kids. You can't get off my lawn. <laughs> um, I routinely got chased by the police on my bicycle for running stop signs. Are you serious? Not routinely. It happened repeatedly, I would say. Not routinely. <laughs> Did you ever get, like, caught? No, no, no. I would just... I mean, they would be on foot. I'd be on my bicycle. They, they were not interested in a chase. So you know that my first me. speeding ticket ever was on a bicycle, right? Did I no, I didn't know that. I don't, so I don't think I've ever told you the story, which means I've not done it on a podcast. We were on Fire Island when I was a kid, which is an island off the coast of Long Island with no cars. And my, parent, my parents' friends had a house there, and we'd go and like spend a week or so. And there, this whatever side of the island, I haven't been there since I was like 10 or 12, whatever side of the island uh, that we're on, there were like all these raised wooden walkways. And that was how you got around. And oh, like boardwalks. Yeah, boardwalks, but I can't tell you, and, but like thorny, thistly shit on like a four foot drop on either side, and I cannot tell you how many times I flew off of one of these and landed in the bushes, because of course I was always like, 
jack the jack the rear brake and slide around a corner and like it was nice and juddery like because it was all on like wood and then you'd hit a wet spot on the wood and gone into the bushes um and in the main area sort of like where where there was actual concrete there was a speed limit i don't don't care uh of five miles an hour and again there are no cars so that must have applied to bikes i was 12 or whatever i don't give a shit and I flew past this, turns out to be police officer, with a battery-powered backpack radar gun. And I was apparently doing 21. And she was very cross with me. Get back here! And I took off. I'm like, what? You're like, you know, I'm going home. Like, my parents are going to protect me. And I will never forget that, like, this massive, like, in my head, it was like a 30 minute car chase from like Ronin or some movie, but this huge chase where she was following me and I'm like flying down the boardwalks. And I remember I got in the house, I slammed the door and I'm like, well, she saw me go. So, so she knew which house I was going in and she knocked on the door of my dad, who was not a very gentle person. Um, and who was probably drunk. (laughs) I'll never forget. Like he's like, Jason, get the door. I'm like, I can't. It's the cops. And he's like, what'd you do? And I'm like, I don't know. I think I was speeding. And I'll never forget. He opens the door and he's like, what do you want? And the, and the cop is like, you know, is, is there a boy here who was just on a bike? And he's like, why? And she's like, because he was doing 21 in a five zone. And he was like, are you fucking kidding me? And just slammed the door in her face. <laughs> and he was like, don't answer the door. And I was like, oh my God, this is my dad. This is my dad protecting me. <laughs> and also teaching me to speed. Mm. And he thought it was the funniest thing in the world. He's like, what do you mean she had a radar gun? And I'm like, she had a gun. I'm like, it was a radar gun. And it, she's like, you were doing 21. And I'm just, fuck. I was scared to death. He was like, yeah, tell her to go fuck herself. Did you tell the other speeding story involving your dad and his company car in Germany? Mm, I think we should do a whole episode on speeding ticket. Yes. That was 172 and a 30. Kilometers. Mm, kilometers. Um, yes. But that, you know, I, we'll do, we need to do one because some guy on Instagram just sent me uh, a DM with a video to, I think it was someone else, I didn't even look, who, who just put a 2ZZ or 2JZ in his uh, Lexus SC300 and posted a video of him doing a, like a quarter mile run and it was 138 miles an hour and the quarter. But at, right after he hits the quarter mile mark, he goes through an intersection. Like a, it's a green light. But I'm like, this is how an entire family dies. Like, this is how you wipe out an entire fucking family. You don't go through a green light at 138 miles an hour. You don't go through any light I mean, at 130 miles an hour. Yes. Better to go through a green light than a red light at that speed. But you, yes. You, you right. be but going through an make, intersection at that speed. Period. Where anyone else is around. And I say this knowing damn well that I got a ticket in my dad's company car doing 171 and a 30. Uh, 171 kilometers, but there was, for the record, no one around except the camera that was hiding in the bushes. Whatever. It's Germany. Many years ago. Um, um, we'll do an episode on our funny speed. I don't have that many. Mine are just kind of sad. Really? Yours are much funnier than mine. Well, I, don't, I have no control over this mouth. So what happens invariably is I get pulled over and then I'm either doing something so fucking terrible. Um, that like, I just, I'm like, arrest, just tell them, just arrest me. Just shoot me in the fucking face. I deserve it. Um, and that of course makes them like, huh? or I open my mouth and this stream of bullshit comes out that I can't even predict. And I have no control over it. And as it's coming out of my mouth, I'm like, the fuck are you, do- are, are you serious? Are you, yeah. Anyway, I have no control over my mouth. You guys should all know that by now. <laughs> Uh, what were um, we actually talking about? We were talking about what is your type? Like, hmm. should we should we stereotype people who are willing to drive one car? All right, so let's think about this way. Who is the, what is the type of person who drives a Japanese car? Like a 1960s Japanese car. 60s Japanese 60s, car. 60s, 70s, 80s. Pick your, I don't care, pick a different I, I would say that 60s is a, is a kind of... Well, I don't know. If it's like a Datsun 510 or a 240Z, it's different than if it's like a Mazda Cosmo or a Skyline. I guess it's amount of it? money, really. Um, I, I only ask, is it because everyone I know that has a 240Z or a 510 also has a Cosmo or a 2000 GT or some other amazing Japanese Yeah, so cars of that era, they're like really good cars, but it's kind mm-hmm. of offbeat and a little bit under the radar and more of an individualist thing. And... Uh, so, so that's different, I would say, in the 60s than it is in, from like the 80s or 90s where there's an element of sort of like practicality and 
sensibleness and like reliableness to it, which uh, I think drives a lot of it. And I think a lot is nostalgia also um, mm. for, I mean, I don't know, this is speculative also because I'm not. Do you have experience with 80s like Honda stuff? Mm, no. Hmm. I didn't. My brother had a '91 Integra, and I went through SCCA hmm. school in the '91 Integra, also. Hmm. Uh, that's cool so, stuff. I, I mean, guess. that's it. You, you. So, I, I. The reason I ask is you immediately went to nostalgia rather than engineering prowess or inherent goodness or some other reason, and I'm just curious about it. I mean. Uh, I guess that's an, a fundamental assumption that it's going to work and that is a, a value that's important to people who buy Japanese cars and I think to some extent German cars too. Like you're, you're buying it for the sort of technical, intrinsic technical properties uh, of it, which I don't know, could be true about British and Italian cars in a different way. I uh, mean, yeah. I mean, there's this joke that British cars have good chassis and Italian cars have good motors. That's kind of a 1950s mindset, I would say. Uh, But like you think about an old, like a vintage Triumph and you're like, oh, the motor's nice, kind of like long stroke and torquey and not revy. And it's kind of a tractor motor, but, you know, or or vintage Lotus. And so like that was kind of their deal was that you were in it for the suspension and brakes and B roads and stuff like that. Whereas an Italian car like an Alfa, the motor is the center point. But I, I don't know that that really holds true. I, I think it holds true only that in, in that the cars are almost always a reflection of the geographical location that they're conceived and built in. Yes. I mean, um, it, it, this is what my major was. My undergraduate major is called Science, Technology, and Society. And basically what you say is that like, technology it reflects the, the cultural values and the place where it comes. It's basically what you just said, which is that a car that comes out of a place is a reflection of the values and the landscape of that place that it came from. So you went to school for fucking four. You spent three hundred thousand dollars at Stanford to to be able to say one sentence. That's the biggest no shit Sherlock thing I've ever fucking heard. <laughs> I mean, sorry. <laughs> I think I did some other stuff while I was there. I hope it was a lot of drugs and speeding through stop signs. Um, yeah, but it, it, honestly, that's that's a that's a, a a thing that I didn't quite understand until I started traveling a lot for work as a journalist. That, like, you know, I moved to Detroit and suddenly American stuff made sense. And then you go to Italy and you drive around the roads around where Ferrari is and then leave there and go and drive around the roads where Lamborghini is. And you realize there's a reason why Ferraris do tight corners and Lambos don't necessarily. Hmm. They're very different geographically. Um, and then, you know, Germany, drive in Germany and see the way Germans drive on the roads that they have. Um, and Autobahns are obviously the, you know, the, the, the highlight there. I mean, yes, and that's that why every German car, when you're going fast, you feel like you're going 46 miles an hour and you can right. take your hands off the steering wheel and the car goes straight down the road. It's just I wouldn't call it every German car, but compared to, you know, German cars have high speed stability as part of their inherent DNA. And it comes from the geography of you know, German roads and British B roads are lumpy, bumpy, twisty back roads. And, um, and they drive fast. They do not, you know, two inches from a hedge. Um, and so typically you'll find that French, uh, uh, British cars have a lot of suspension travel and composure where French cars have a lot of suspension travel and composure at slow speeds, mm-hmm. um, as they're sort of smoking their cigarette and throwing tomatoes at each other. I don't know what the French, they're, the, they're more miserable than we are as hmm. curmudgeons. Um, yeah, it's, it, that's, it's a, sort of a cool thing to, to see that the, the cars are a reflection of the people, but then also the people who buy them also are a reflection of, of where those cars came from. Yeah, um, yeah, and it's an expression of their personal preference or their mm-hmm. type of driving that they enjoy. I mean, and this is why I have a lot of different stuff is because I enjoy different, uh, mm, different experiences, but also because uh, if you experience a lot of different stuff, you're like, oh, there's a lot of cool redeeming features over here also, and I just never bothered to go over there before, but now that I have, I'm like, oh, I'm kind of into this. It's kind of fun. I got to say, this, this week has been a great example of that for me because I have, so all my cars are German except for one Italian and one Brit. Um, historically, almost every car I've ever owned has been, um, has been German. Um, there are exceptions here and there. Um, but this week, I have an Alpha, I have a Lancia Delta Integrale that I'm borrowing from work. I'm driving that around and I got out of that and I had to help a friend move um, a, a 240Z, Datsun 240Z. And I drove it 70 miles 
um, through the, the whole city of San Francisco. I spent a lot of time with it. I've driven this car before and I'm completely in love with it. I mean, totally, completely in love with it. Um, and I, you know, I walked over to him and it was the day after he turned 50. And I'm like, I, 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 I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant to tell a 50.01 year old man what to do with his life and time. Don't you ever fucking sell this car. <laughs> he was like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, you can't sell it. It's amazing. It, the, that straight six sounds better than almost every V12 I've ever been in. The car is just magic. And that makes me think, why don't I have a Japanese car? And then I get in the Delta Negrale and everywhere you go, that's thumbs up. And I mean, there are bikers on the roads around here. The bicyclists, I should say, are the biggest bunch of entitled beep, beep, beep. I mean, I'm not even going to call, I'm not going to say the words I call them. Um, I hate these people. They're all thumbs up. I come around a corner at, at, of course, below the speed limit at a very, very practical. Sensible, responsible. Sensible, responsible speed. Christian. Chris, I, I was imitating a nun coming around a corner yesterday and there's a biker there and I'm like, ah, crap. And this particular road is, you know, speed limit is 100 and I was only doing 48. Um, and I'm really moving and I'm expecting the, the, you know, throwing a rock at me or screaming, slap, or the, this, there. And all I got was a thumbs up and the biggest smile I've seen in months. <laughs> and I'm like, I need a Delta. Why don't I have a lunch at Delta Negrale? Um, it, it's so important i think that people try different things because if we pigeonhole ourselves as like i'm a german car guy and you're an italian car guy this whatever there's so much stuff out there um that is great i just don't know if it's great enough that i want it but that's a different story well you have the greatness to the cost ratio the greatness to cost ratio is very important or the i only have so many slots ratio like mm-hmm. how many cars can i possibly maintain and i can't yeah. i can't have 50 cars i can't have 10 um, but I really think it's time for me to put something Japanese in my, in my garage, not just a, a Lotus with a Japanese engine in it. Yeah. I, I mean the 240Z for me, I bought it because I was like, I want a vintage experience. I love the way inline six is sound. I think the 240Z is beautiful, uh, and I can afford it. And so that's, this was when two, before 240Zs became as valuable as they are. And so I just was, I mean, i what I would have loved to buy, I suppose was an E-type, but this was an order of magnitude less money. Uh, and I and is it as good to drive? Is the is good to drive as the 240? Is that car? Sorry, we were frozen again. The two the 240 is better. I would say it's more modern. Uh, I love driving E types. The, the but the motors are kind of torque torquey, low revving, long stroke E type motors, uh, and that's sort of fine. There's just not a whole lot of reward associated with revving them out. And 240s, you know, depending on the state of tune and what motor it is. I mean, mine had this monster three liter with triple uh, Delorto carburetors. And so it just sounded like sex. I mean, I decided I was going to buy one when I heard one drive by and I was like, I, I need that in my life. Yeah. Cause uh, we've talked about this before. I think inline sixes I, are my favorite noises, car, no, car engine noises to listen to. Hopefully you have a video that's better than mine, but if not, I, don't, we'll, I didn't take a single video of that car. I just did. So the owner of that car was in front of me with his, in his pickup truck with another car on a trailer. And I made it like 40 miles before I finally was like, he's got to hear this thing. Cause I don't think he's ever been outside the car and had passing. We were in a, in a tunnel and I, I, I was like premature acceleration. I was next to a wall. The tunnel was coming up. I was next to him and I was trying to hold back so I could fly by him at the top of second gear in the tunnel. And I, I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait. I had to get on the gas because I heard it reflecting off the wall next to me. It is the most insane sound. Oh my God. And same thing. It's a Rebello built three liter with tri- triple carbs on it. I, I uh, that 240Z. I mean, I, I've never driven a stock one. I've driven the Rebello yeah, car and I've driven a Z432. But oh my God. Oh my God. That is such an underrated car that drives better than almost any Ferrari under one hundred and fifty thousand dollars I've ever driven. Hmm. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna challenge that statement. I I believe it. It's a hell of a car for the money, even with the, what they are now. And I sold mine for thirteen grand. Oh, what are they now? What's a, what's a nice two forty Z worth? Uh, twenty five to three hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was that one crazy one. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, really 20, nice if, you, one. if you set aside twenty five to $35,000, you can get yourself a, a, a nice car. I could do that. I could, I could, I could see spending twenty five dollars or $30,000 on that car. It's worth twice that in the driving yeah. experience. Uh, you would have to spend four times that, put it this way, to get a better driving experience and noise. 
So, I mean, but could you be a Japanese car guy? Could you be that guy? Could you be guy? I mean, Z? I have already been that guy. I what would other... do it again, and it's a car, one of the cars I most regret selling. Okay, fair enough. And you um, know how but desperately I want a 2000 GT, and of course I have a Miata right now, which gives me the most smiles per dollar of any car I've ever owned, because yeah, it was but... virtually no dollars, and it makes me <laughs> smile continuously. <laughs> yeah, you have a fun Miata. I'm trying to think, so what, is there a nationality of car you have never owned? Uh, I have never owned an American car. Uh, me neither. But I, there are, there's one, I don't know why this, I have literally no idea. This is the most incongruous thing for me of, of all things. But I, I desperately want a 1963 and a half Ford Galaxy fastback coupe. Uh, really? Yeah. Like it's, it, it is in the, if I had to make a list of five cars that I would buy in the foreseeable future, it's on there. I'm... I, actually, I mean, I've heard you mention them before. I put, I, a, I put a deposit on one, and I flew to Colorado, and, and I was going to buy it, but then it had been hit really hard in the back and not well repaired, and it was a color it had been color changed quite poorly, and so I didn't buy it. But I guess as a testament to how serious I am about Galaxy ownership, one of the, the reason I haven't bought one is because I know it's not going to appreciate, and if I'm going to be spending money on a car, I want to make I want to buy something with I think potential to appreciate. That's funny because there are a couple of American cars that I want. Like, you know, I would love to have a late 60s Camaro. I would love to have a Boat Tail Riviera mm -hmm. or, you know, they're just, they're all high style things. So it's never about performance. There's no American performance car that I've ever wanted. Um, but uh, I guess Camaro is in some way. But yeah. um, I would like a 61 Continental also. Yeah. I mean, in, I don't, that's not me, but I can see that we're going in the same place. We're going for that look and that. You know, enormity and uh, all the things that all of the European and, and Asian cars that we own aren't. But the, what stopped me is actually not having tools. <laughs> not having a, a non-metric tools? Yeah. Uh, I mean, at funny. one point I was like, I'm going to have to buy. If I buy this car, I'm going to have to buy a whole set of tools for it. I don't want, I don't, and my toolbox is full. Like, <laughs> a big toolbox and it's full. What am I going to do? Buy another toolbox just to work on this thing? Oh, and by the way, then it's enormous, so it's not going to fit in the garage. And so, you know, that's sort of been what stopped me. I don't know anything about them. Like, it's all super simple stuff. But, like, my field of expertise lies elsewhere. Um, so it's like this, I don't know what I'm looking for. I don't know what I'm doing. You know, I'll drag Mike Musto or someone in who does know if I ever come to buy one. But, like, then I have to commit to thousands of dollars in tools. I think this is what prevents people, not specifically the toolbox issue, but like this sort of uh, the, the cost of the network effects of switching. Because I, what a lot of people will, who are into cars will do is they develop like a social network that is built around their car enthusiasm. You know, you have your VW friends or you have your Porsche friends or you have like a, a social group. And that's one of the reasons like in my sort of Stanford intellectual masturbation thing or whatever that I did was... That like there's socializing reasons that we like cars too, right? The people always say, I mean, you hear this in the industry a lot. They're like, I'm super like grateful to do what I love, and that, but it's really the people that make it so great. And I've met all these great people, and I love hanging out with you guys, and the whole like love fest thing. And this will be happening on a rally or among a group of dealers of vintage cars or whoever have these conversations about like how it's about people. And I'm so grateful for all the people that I met. And so if you sell your whatever car it is or you leave that community and switch to another one, then you lose the sort of people who are dear to you. And so I think that's one of another barrier for, for, for changing allegiances. Uh, so it, it's kind of, you know, and you're like, oh, I want to hang out with these people all the time, but I want to have this other car. And so you get this sort of tension. And I think that's what one of the sort of network effects. And you know where to get parts and you get to know them really well and it's kind of right. familiar and you just know the landscape. When you get a new car where you're like, I've never owned one of these and you have to learn all this stuff and like talk to, Barrier. you know, 24 guys where they're like, oh yes, you, in order to get the speedometer sender for your Alfa Romeo, you've got to talk to this guy, this crazy Larry dude who is, runs a junkyard in the Central Valley of California breaking alphas. And like, that's the only place you can get a speedometer sender for an Alfa right. GTV6. Like, and that type of stuff is not the kind of stuff that just floats around freely on the internet. You have to like talk to a bunch of guys and make this investment to get to know the landscape if you want to properly steward you, some you car totally that you never own. Like this happened when I bought my Peugeot 405. It's like there's some guy 
who is in Vermont or New Hampshire who has like incredible supply of Peugeot parts and that's where you have to go. And then like, mm -hmm. what mechanic do you use? Like you can't, so there's, there's a barrier to, to switching sure. especially as you get into the more obscure stuff. Yeah. Uh, and even if it's not obscure, you have to learn, you know, how to look after it. And there's an investment there and it's like, Oh, we just much easier to buy this thing that I know the guy for and that I have this, right. you know, relationship with, you know, the parts supplier or the mechanic or whoever it is where, you know, he'll be like, oh, yes, it's me, and you don't even have to give a last name. There's something comforting about, about that right. type of ownership. If experience. I performed contact tracing on my entire network of friends to figure out where I met them and how, probably half of them, half of the people that I've been friends with, for, lifelong friends, came from my Volkswagen, mm -hmm. which is kind of a crazy thing. Um, and now some of them have moved to Audi. Some of them stuck with Volkswagen. Some of them have done, you know, sort of branched out. Some of them have minivans. <laughs> Some, many of them do. Um, but, uh, you know, the, interestingly enough, in the last 10 years, I've, I've met more people who are sort of brand agnostic, I think, and are just looking at either an era or, like I said, that well, color. Well, you've you probably know. come to that point yourself, and so now you're starting to be attracted to other people. And then that actually gives you great network effects because then you're like, oh, there's someone in my network who knows the answer to this right. question or knows someone who knows the answer. Well, once, you, once you sort of break out of that, that comfort zone of like, okay, I know everything. Like, I didn't realize how comfortable I was with, that, with my Scirocco until I did a road trip with a friend two years ago. And it, the car started behaving weird. And I'm like, oh, fuck, here we go. And he, he was like, what? What's the matter? We're, like, we're in the middle of a, a desert. And it's 11 o'clock at night. I'm like, ah, throttle feels a little weird. Hold on. Clutch in the car's at two thousand RPM, and it wound up being the the throttle um, the throttle stop backed out. So on the side of the road, eleven o'clock at night, whatever it was, pitch dark. I pulled over, adjusted the throttle, and kept going. And then I'm like, I smell something. What's the matter? And he's like, you know, he's constantly hysterical. Like, are we gonna be dead in the middle of the road? I'm like, no, that smells like CV grease on the exhaust. Like, it just there's so many things. I'm so comfortable with that car. Um, that I could drive that every day and I don't think about, like, I know every noise it makes and I know if, if it breaks, I've, it's something that I've had apart five times. I don't, there's zero stress attached. And I didn't realize that until I was in the car with someone who loves Hondas. And so he's never been around break, breakdowns. Um, but he's also, you know, nothing to do with VWs. And he was just like, what the fuck, what the fuck, what the fuck? Um, what you realize when you break out of that comfort zone for the first time, you go into a different type of car is, the relationships that you build in that I built, for example, with VW are relationships that I will then build with BMWs and a relationship that I will then build with my insert other a Lotus, Ferrari, Jaguar, whatever else, whatever other type of car you want, you will build those relationships too. And it's worth jumping over that first hurdle yeah. to then to meet those other people. It takes going to one back in the days that we could one car show where you start talking to one person who's like, oh, I know everyone and everything about this car. Yes. And then you just... You've made a friend. Like you haven't just found a mechanic or a parts guy or you know the one guy who was a speedo sensor. You've now made a friend who you can go hang out with or you know talk to and instant messenger. <laughs> um, now, now, and I think that is the coolest part about well, and all these so different brands of crazy. To, to share this the the value that they get out of that car with someone new and to sort of be evangelical about yeah. it and say like, I want to show you the world the way I see it mm -hmm. because I see it through this like Alfa Romeo colored lens or this whatever it is colored lens and I want you to see the world the same way because I think the world looks beautiful in that way and I right, think you, you should want, see it too. These are machines that bring us so much joy, right? That, you know, that friggin' Scirocco, 22 years of my life bringing me joy. Why wouldn't I want it, somebody else to have that same experience with their own, not mine, stay with mine. But, you know, but people all the time DM, like they'll Instagram DM me and ask me, hey, what is wrong with my Scirocco? They're always asking me Scirocco questions or 2316, any of the cars that I sort of like publicly own. Um, and I'm very happy. And they're so surprised and thankful that I'm giving them advice. But it's there for a reason. Like I want them to enjoy this car. Though if somebody can enjoy their Scirocco or any car half as much as I've enjoyed my Volkswagen over the last two decades... Uh, they've, they've, they will have a, a wonderful life experience to look back on. So we should all be spreading those joy. Whether we know their, or like their type of crazy or not, um, that's why we're car guys. And I didn't have to go to Stanford to know that. I mean... <laughs> I love this dig. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, I would say that I just used the enthusiasm I have for cars as a vehicle to write a paper that I was otherwise going to have to write. And I would say that I'm jealous that you got to go to Stanford and I didn't. And I probably wouldn't have gotten in anyway, so it's all good. I'm just fucking with you. I mean, uh, it, it was... Uh, I actually, I transferred in. I, I didn't even apply as a freshman. I just transferred in. And I, if I had known what the... If, if I had known what was involved, I probably... In getting in, I probably wouldn't have applied, but fortunately, I didn't know better, and I just got lucky. Look, but it was... you have a master's in, from Stanford. I have a, a master's in law, and we're sitting here talking about <laughs> cars. Well, yeah. <laughs> Education so it's a life, is... You it's know. a lifelong passion, and people are like, oh, how do you do what you do? And it's like, I, I don't know. I hung out with cars a lot, and then I kind of just kept hanging out with cars. Well, like, you have a lottery. What the fuck are you doing playing with cars? Because life is too short. This is all about putting smiles on our face. So, it becomes increasingly clear nowadays as smiles become like forbidden or harder to come by or more carefully engineered. In yeah, because they're putting wrinkles on our faces. That's what you're talking about, right? Mm. Time for Botox? I'm going to just move away from the screen. Except that the further you move away, the more you have these dangly things mm-hmm. here. We need to come up with a better solution. No, this is fine. Every, every, yep. the, everyone says the audio is good. Uh, I was, know, but it, it's very difficult. Are you bored? It's very di- is it time yes. to go? Yeah, it's you time be, to go. Be it's taken one hour and one minute. Okay. No, it's just, you know, I just think maybe we should wear white t-shirts. Is that, like, will that make this look less awkward? I, I you know what's going to be really funny? The people who are listening to this on, like, the podcast providers are going to like, what are they talking about? We are talking about our Apple dangly bits. Uh, anything else headphones. to cover before we, we, we release Mr. ADD here? <laughs> yes. Uh, you should probably look at our t-shirts, take a long, hard look, and realize you want one of these t-shirts because they're really cool, plus we want to support Jack and ECME. Me. Um, and so there will be in the description below, or somehow, somewhere, there will be a way for you to buy the I Hate Everyone t-shirt, the Get Off My Lawn t-shirt, probably also the ECME uh wheel the launcher um, the, Delta, which is a launcher delta integrale wheel, wheel. yep um and more importantly if you like this podcast or video or whatever you're looking don't forget to subscribe um click the notification bell write something terrible in the comments below um maybe not terrible but like uh maybe... terrible if it's constructive and true you completely froze up while you were saying that which <laughs> I'm very happy about because you probably said something positive and life affirming. I said, write something terrible if it's true. Oh yeah, it's fine. Let us have it. I don't care. Just don't talk about my hair because, you know, week 200 of lockdown. <laughs>